Thank you all so much for having me here this evening. I'm honored to be here, not only to celebrate with you 10 years of honoring our wounded warfighters, but to share with you the story of my life as a wife of one of our wounded warfighters. My husband, Dennis, and I were married in February 2005, just before workups began for deployment. In all the preparations you go through as a family for deployment, the realities of what can actually happen at war don't really cross your mind. We never really had a discussion about what if. I don't really even remember it being a thought. It was 10 years ago this past October that our lives changed forever. October 15th, 2005 was a Saturday and I just happened to be working. A girlfriend of mine who was listed as the one person to always know where I was should the command need to get a hold of me stopped by my office. She smiled sweetly and nodded her head. You know, that look that people give you when they're about to give you really bad news. She said that she had gotten a call from Dennis's command and that she needed to come find me and have me call Colonel Aaron Slaughter. I immediately dropped to my knees without any emotion. I just kept saying, what happened, what happened, what happened? Of course, she didn't know, but I was comforted by the thought that if it was really that bad, she wouldn't be the one here to come and find me. Aaron Slaughter read me the casualty report. Second Lieutenant Dennis M. Oliverio had sustained a gunshot wound to the left arm and was stable. At the time, Iraqi elections were going on and all communication was cut off in and out of the country. This is the only information I received for the next four days until he got back into the States. On October 19th, I sat with my mom in the lobby of Bethesda Naval Medical Center. I expected other families there with banners and balloons welcoming their wounded warfighters home but it was just me and my mom. A white school bus drove in front of the hospital and as I sat there, I watched them wheel gurney into the, into the lobby. I never imagined that was my husband. He was a gunshot wound to the arm, so surely he could just walk right off the bus. But all the doctors and nurses stopped and looked at me and I realized it was him and things were much worse than I had thought. He looked so tired. I didn't know what to say or what to do? What could I say? His arm was covered with a sheet. and At this time, I still didn't know how bad things really were. I followed the team of medical staff into the elevator to his room, which would be our new home for the next six weeks. Dennis had sustained a single round through his left arm. The bullet shattered the humerus bone, severed the brachial artery, and severed the median nerve. The bone was being held together by an external fixator, so there were pins and rods keeping his arm together, and drainage tubes filled with blood and other bodily fluids to keep the fluid swelling down. I walked into his room so scared, not knowing what to say or what to do or what would happen next. This was not how my life was supposed to be. We just got married, and now look where we are. He looked so tired. There was still blood in his fingernails, the same blood that was still in the sands in Iraq, and his clothes were so big on his body, and his hand was so swollen. I just sat there. That first night, after I coordinated with all eight of his brothers and sisters, I sat in a chair next to his hospital bed with a toothbrush and a bowl of soapy water, scrubbing the four-day-old blood out from under his nails. I sat and slept in that chair every day for six weeks until he checked out. Those weeks were by far the most difficult and exhausting time of my entire life. With little or no sleep, I woke before sunrise every day to meet with the med student, and an hour later to meet with the intern, and an hour later to meet with the doctor. They all asked me the exact same questions, and I gave them the exact same answers. The nurses taught me how to do the daily cleanings of his incisions and how to drain all of his drain tubes. But on top of that, medical routine, we still had a life that had to go on. We had mortgages and bills to pay, and I had a job. Just coordinating with his eight brothers and sisters was a job on its own. And the entire world was on my shoulders. I remember a day when we were still in Bethesda. Dennis's brothers stood in tears at the foot of his hospital bed. Dennis, being the constant comedian, says to his brother, think of the bright side. At least you'll get another set of golf clubs. I won't be needing those anymore. That night, when all was quiet, Dennis looked at me in horror as the harsh reality that 
Life as he knew it was over, and he may never play golf again. Finally, around 2006, we got word that he was being permanently stationed to Patuxent River Naval Air Station. We finally felt we were able to move on with our lives and regain some sense of normalcy. Dennis began working at the Marine Aviation Detachment fairly regularly, pinned on first lieutenant. I went back to work full time, and two months later, we found out we were having a baby. So much for normalcy. During this time of establishing our new normal life, my dad had asked Dennis to go golfing with him while we were on summer vacation. After numerous surgeries, Dennis was left with minimal mobility in his left arm at the elbow, lacked his feeling in his left hand, and lacked the ability to open his and close his hand. I encouraged Dennis to go, even if he just sat in the cart. It would be good to get out and get some fresh air. When he came back from the course, I saw life in his eyes that I hadn't seen in a long time. I did it, I can golf, he said. That night, had, he had more movement in his arm than I had ever seen. Golf, something he thought he'd never do again, was healing him physically and mentally. Shortly after the discovery that golf could be a reality, Dennis began participating in the weekly golf clinics at Only Golf Park in Only, Only Maryland. The coaches there were able to teach him new ways to golf with his physical limitations. Because of organizations like DSUSA, I have watched my husband change from not capable to more than capable. I see a hunger in him and a drive and a love for the competition and adrenaline that sports provides, a feeling that he thought was gone forever without the core. Dennis has become a dynamic competitor on the Golf Channel Am Tour, as well as representing the United States in two abroad golf tournaments against the UK. He is by far a much better golfer now than he ever was before injury. <laughs> and 10 years later, he still tells me it's therapy every time he goes to the course. <laughs> Just recently, Dennis has joined an equestrian team comprised of injured veterans. Together, they learn and compete in cow cutting, calf roping, horsemanship events. Our daughter, Natalie, who is a genuine cowgirl, is thrilled about the idea of a daddy-daughter calf roping team. It's been over 10 years since my husband came home a different man than I married. Even after all this time, there is never a day that passes that I don't think about what happened to him and what happened to us. Sometimes it's a brief thought. Other times it consumes me. 10 years later, we still have really bad days. I don't know if those days I'll wake up to the good witch or the bad witch. But he tries, and more times than not, succeeds at being the husband he wants to, me to have and the father he wants to be. It's been a privilege to watch him grow as a person with the help of DSUSA. It has been a privilege to be his wife in sickness and in health. And I thank God every day for the bond that this tragedy has created in us and our family. As Lou Holtz said, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you respond to it. Thank you. Thank you.